Okay, and without further ado, I will pass over to Brett to take us through the presentation. Over to you, Brett. Great, thanks, Emma. Uh, so welcome, my name is Brett Trigano, and I'm an aquatic biologist with Kortha Conservation. And this is another um, round in our speaker series, this one about water temperature in fish in the Kortha watershed. And I'll just be um, a brief presentation followed by any questions that you have, and so we'll we'll get going. Just to kind of orient us where we're talking about, the area of focus um, for the presentation is what we're calling the Kawartha watershed. So here's Southern Ontario, um, and this area here, um, kind of South Central Ontario, is our area of focus for today. This is what we call the Kawartha Conservation Watershed. Um, our administrative office is Ken Reed Conservation Area, just north of Lindsay on the shore of Sturgeon Lake. And yeah, we're one of 36 conservation authorities. Um, pleasure to work in this area. Our jurisdiction is about 2,500 square kilometers um, and includes about five large lakes, uh, Lake Scugog in the south, Balsam Lake, Cameron Lake, Sturgeon Lake, um, part of Pigeon Lake, including Crystal Lake up in the northeast corner. And um, our jurisdiction covers several municipalities, um, City Kortha Lakes being the primary one, uh, also Durham Region in the township of Scugog, and Peterborough County in the municipality of Trent Lakes, as well as a couple of small other ones. Uh, we're also in the traditional area of the Williams Treaties, First Nations. And our primary role at the Conservation Authority is to help manage our natural resources, um, in particular water tends to be an area of focus for us. Um, but we also keep people safe from environmental hazards like flooding, um, erosion, et cetera. And we have a few branches uh, within our organization. We have a regulations and planning branch, an environmental monitoring branch, um, integrated watershed management, which, which I'm a part of and, and part of Emma's team. Um, stewardship branch, we also manage a number of conservation areas. So we, we own land and are stewards of that land. And we also have a numerous special projects based on uh, partner requests or municipal requests, things like floodplain mapping, lake management planning, and numerous other uh, science and, and stewardship based programs. But today is about fish habitat and water temperature. And we're just going to scratch the surface here, uh, give you an introduction on some of our aquatic ecosystems, some of our fishes and the relationship between them and water temperature. And so we're, we're blessed in this area with numerous lakes, um, the large water bodies like I talked about, but also smaller water bodies, um, things like vernal pools and farm ponds and kind of smaller uh, man-made impoundments and that type of thing. Uh, most of which contain fish. And my experience, wherever there's water, chances are there's going to be fish. Uh, we also have numerous larger rivers um, connecting our major lakes, but also draining some of our larger watersheds. Anything from kind of slow, sluggish, meandering uh, rivers to kind of more uh, higher gradient, faster flowing ones. Um, smaller streams as well anything from kind of small, what people would call ditches in agricultural landscapes to more of a natural setting, what you think of as a, as a headwater stream in a forest. Wetlands are also important fish habitat along the margins of our lakes um, and streams and rivers. And we have numerous wetlands within this area, all of which, or most of which uh, contain fish as well. And speaking of fish, when we talk about fish in the Kortha watershed, most people can kind of conjure up these species. Um, they tend to be kind of the recreational fish, things like large and smallmouth bass and musky and uh, sunfish, which is a term for several of species such as like bluegill and pumpkin seed. Um, if you're kind of a more keener, you might know some creek dwelling fish like creek chub, um, 
rainbow trout, that type of thing. But in actuality, we have a lot more species of fish in our, um, in our area. There's upwards of 60 plus species of fish, um, many of which no one's even heard about, but all of them are important for you know, naturally functioning aquatic ecosystems. Um, there's numerous invasive fish that you know, are new that can be added to this list, like the round goby, for example. Um, there's some occurrences of some rare fish and some of these hybridized as well. But there's about 60 plus species um, in our watershed that uh, all have unique life history traits. And um, because they are cold-blooded, um, they are significantly impacted by water temperature. And biologists can separate out different species of fish based on um, what we call their thermal regime or their thermal guild, their, their classification. And so if you look on the left there, we have um, warm water fish. So these are fish that um, tend to prefer higher temperatures, um, greater than 25 degrees Celsius, for example. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have cold water fish, uh, which prefer relatively colder waters, say less than 19 degrees. And in the middle, um, fishes that we call cool water uh, from about 19 to 25 degrees. And this is just to help biologists and um, resource managers kind of help set expectations for what type of fish could be found in certain environments. Um, not to say that a cold water fish can't be found, for example, in 20 or 22 degree water. It's just um, they do well in these certain temperatures. They have a competitive advantage and they tend to be found in waters, uh, particularly in the summer uh, when water temperatures kind of are within those ranges. And so here's just singling out the cold water uh, fishes you might be aware of. Um, brook trout, we'll talk about later today, um, is a species that of particular significance to us. But there are numerous others. Um, trout perch is an interesting one, slimy sculpin, rainbow trout, lake chub. Um, we also have some remnant populations of lake trout up in Crystal Lake. Here's our warm water um, fish. These are the typical ones that you think of like large and small mouth bass and, and our pumpkin seed and, and brown bullhead, often called mud cat around here and everything in between. Um, the Kortha Lakes is typically known as a warm water fishery. And so the point I'm trying to make here is there's, there's a lot more fish um, in our lakes than just warm water fish. And in fact, water temperature has a significant influence on um, not just where fish are, the distribution of fish, but everything from their metabolism. So for example, how fast they grow um, to their feeding habits, uh, the depth at which they're found, um, their swimming speed, and ultimately their survival. Um, for example, uh, a cold water fish doesn't do very well. Um, it can't survive in, in relatively warm temperatures. Here's a table here that just kind of summarizes some general characteristics between the most extreme, so cold water fishes and warm water fishes. And uh, there's exceptions to all of these patterns, um, but generally cold water fishes spawn, they reproduce in the fall, uh, whereas warm water fish are in the spring. Um, cold water fish tend to be found in spring fed streams, uh, deep lakes, and are relatively limited in terms of the ge geography. They're not that widespread in our area. Whereas warm water fishes, they're typically found everywhere um, in all of our lakes and in most of our streams. Another interesting fact about cold water fishes is they're relatively sensitive. Um, so they typically only occur in kind of these clean, cold waters with high dissolved oxygen content. Whereas warm water fish, um, they can typically survive uh, just about everywhere and they're, they're not as sensitive, for example. Just focusing in on some of our uh, cold water habitat within deep lakes, this is a graph showing uh, water temperature on the horizontal axis here and water depth on the vertical with zero being the water surface. And this is what we call a thermal profile in the summer. Um, so we take water temperature measurements every meter as we go down um, from the surface down to the depth. 
And as you can see, water temperatures um, are not consistent in the summer, generally in our lakes from surface to bottom. They tend to start off relatively warm and then they get cool. And so if we're looking at, okay, what part of our lakes have cold water habitat, for example, we can add this 19 degrees kind of, you know, working threshold, if you call it, for our, our cold water fish. And if we run that next to the depth at which 19 degrees is found, we can see generally um, between the five and 12 meter mark in the summer is where we hit this kind of cold water habitat with an average of about eight and a half meters. So if you have um, a lake in your jurisdiction or in your neighborhood, or if your property's on a lake and um, it has a depth, a maximum depth of, um, on average about eight and a half meters or deeper, chances are you have sensitive cold water fish um, in that lake. Here's an example showing Pigeon Lake and Pigeon Lake is on this graph in light blue on the left. And um, the 19 degree mark is approximately around the nine meter depth. And which means these kind of sensitive cold water fish um, really only occupy the deeper depths of Pigeon Lake um, in the north, just around Big Island or Boyd Island. Whereas warm water and cold water fish, they basically have access to not only this cold water habitat, but the entire lake as well. Just focusing on three kind of high profile fish, um, just to illustrate some of the differences between warm, cool, and cold water. Uh, the top one there is musky or muscalunge. This is considered a warm water fish. Um, so they spawn in May between nine and 16 degrees Celsius, typically found in, um, in all of our lakes and the outlets of larger rivers. And they prefer water temperatures of about 22 to 26 degrees Celsius. Uh, walleye um, or pickerel is a cool water fish. Um, so they spawn a little earlier than our warm water fish. They spawn in April. Um, between four and 11 degrees Celsius. Um, also found in kind of our larger waters, um, prefer slightly colder temperatures between 19 and 23 degrees Celsius. And brook trout, <clears throat> an example of a cold water fish. Um, again, they're fall spawners. Um, so they, they spawn in, in um, generally in October. Um, so a couple weeks from now um, and they spawn in relatively colder temperatures between kind of three and nine degrees Celsius. Um, they're not really found in our lakes and rivers. Um, they're more localized to our groundwater fed streams or spring fed streams or headwater streams. And the preferred water temperatures are the lowest of them all, um, uh, generally under 22 degrees Celsius with an optimal temperature of around 17 degrees Celsius or so. And these are considered a sensitive organism. In fact, all cold water fish are um, for the reasons I mentioned before. And this is why some of our monitoring programs focus on identifying um, the habitat of brook trout and cold water streams. So here's another map showing our jurisdiction, the Kortha watershed. And we have about 2,800 kilometers of creeks. So if you were to add up all the meandering creeks and rivers and tie them all together and stretch them out, um, their length is about 2,800 kilometers. Uh, however, only about a fifth of all of those, uh, about 21% are considered sensitive um, cold water streams. And the top five um, watersheds are Pigeon River, Nonquan River, Fleetwood Creek, Lake Scugog Tributaries and East Cross Creek. Most of these occur at the south end of our geography. Um, the reason for that is because of the Oak Ridges Moraine, which is a significant landform um, in Southern Ontario. And it's basically been called the rain, um, it's uh, basically the rain barrel of Southern Ontario. It's a significant groundwater recharge area, which allows then water to percolate through the ground, get nice and cold, and then be discharged into our creeks um, as nice cold water. Here's a, a graph uh, called a thermal graph, which is a, just a fancy term for water temperature over time. And so here we have, um, this is actually air temperature. 
And on the left-hand side here, we have degrees Celsius. And on the bottom, we have from January 1st to December. So we have a year's worth of time. And if we plot our warm water streams, we can see they're heavily influenced by air temperature. They generally follow the same pattern where, whereby um, in the winter they freeze up entirely as air temperatures are, are extremely cold. And in the summer, they crank right up almost you know, 25 degrees, for example, amplitude, and generally follow the pattern of our air temperatures and gradually reduce in the fall back to the winter. And this is the case for a warm water stream. And it's also the case for the shallower areas of our lakes. Now, if we contrast the thermograph of a cold water stream, um, it's very different. Uh, it's more stable, as we call it. So the fluctuations from the maximum temperatures in the summer, for example, to the minimum temperatures in the winter um, is only about half that of, of a warm water stream. And this also applies to the deeper sections of our lakes. And for example, um, that cold groundwater that comes in, for example, um, doesn't allow that water to freeze in the winter. Um, so it stays generally around four degrees Celsius, three to four degrees Celsius. And in the summer, when temperatures are really hot outside, you know, they're 20, on average 25 degrees, for example, a cold water stream, a healthy functioning one anyways, um, you know, it was only in between the 10, 15 degree mark. So not a significant amplitude change. And cool water systems, they're somewhere in the middle. And through our monitoring programs, we monitor um, water temperatures on these cold water streams because they're so sensitive and so limited in geography. And we deploy these water temperature sensors at 32 stations along streams that have been characterized as cold water. So they've been sampled and are known to contain, for example, brook trout or slimy sculpin or model sculpin um, or other cold water fish. And we attach these little sensors, they're about the size of a toonie, um, to a brick, and we leave them in there all year round. And when we end up pulling them and downloading the data, uh, we analyze them for kind of the maximum temperatures, the minimum temperatures, average temperature fluctuations, that type of thing. We also look um, from a fish specific point of view at, for example, um, the percentage of optimal brook trout days. So the percentage of the record that has um, days where temperature never exceeded 17 degrees Celsius, which is the optimal value for brook trout. Um, and then also lethal brook trout days. So anything above 25 degrees Celsius, uh, cold water fish can't really survive at all. So it really helps us gauge uh, the quality um, and whether or not our cold water streams remain capable of supporting sensitive cold water life. And so our key findings um, <clears throat> over a kind of a five year average period of doing this, um, kind of concerning, we found about 50% of our sites are degraded. Um, so they're, they're relatively warm. And in fact, they're likely too warm in and around these areas to continue to support uh, cold water fish. Uh, another key finding is that our air temperatures significantly affect our water temperatures. Um, so, and this has profound implications for climate change, for example. So those really hot summers, um, we tend to have lower quality habitat. We tend to have higher water temperatures and um, all else being equal, uh, the colder summers, for example, um, we have better habitat. We also found that online ponds, which we'll get into in a bit, are a significant contributor, contributor to um, stream warming. And this is something that we can actually change. We can actually mitigate through stewardship on the landscape. And the map on the right is just showing the, the locations, the highlighted areas of our cold water streams again, and all of our sampling points and anything in a, in a light green or a dark green um, is a, a good or a fair to good. So this is, um, you know, we've got uh, a lot of days where we've got cold temperatures below 17 degrees and never really exceeds 25 degrees. These are our coldest streams um, in, our, in our area, for example, and still capable likely of supporting, you know, healthy brook trout populations. Um, whereas the red and the orange 
Um, these are the poor or the fair to poor. And um, just like to draw your attention to this one right here on the southeast of our jurisdiction. This is Fleetwood Creek. And you see we have a green here followed by three reds. This green is actually the coldest um, site within our jurisdiction, followed by the three warmest sites um, on the data record. And we'll get into why that is in a second. So online ponds, I mentioned they are um, an issue and there's, there's three main types of, of ponds you might see on the landscape as you're, as you're driving by or as you're wading through the creek. Um, one is considered an offline pond. So this is where the creek flows uh, well away from where the pond is. It's kind of an isolated feature. It's not really connected. Um, whereas you have these bypass ponds or these connected ponds where water from the creek is connected to the pond um, and discharge, particularly under high flow events. Um, and then you have these other ponds that are directly connected to the creek. Uh, usually it's a creek that's been dammed. Um, and one of the issues with this is that depending on how large the pond is, um, if you can imagine a really large pond, you have the sunlight beating down, you know, in the summer it gets really hot. Um, well, basically it, it warms up the system. You've got a lot more surface area now, it's a lot less shading and temperatures um, really crank up. And most of these ponds are what we call top draw ponds. If you think of like a, a beaver dam, for example, where water goes over the top. And because warm water sits on top of cold water, just because of physics, it's that warm water that's, that's now um, flowing over the top and into our natural could be a cold water stream. <clears throat> and now back to Fleetwood Creek. So we have four temperature data loggers on Fleetwood Creek, which is our uh, historically a, a sensitive cold water stream. And if we look at just kind of average temperatures from the headwaters, so it's flowing from south to north, so from the bottom to the top, we have one of our coldest sites at average temperature of 13.6 degrees. Our next site, only about a couple kilometers as the crow flies downstream, um, is 23.6 degrees Celsius, followed by the next two, which are relatively the same. And if we just look at the change in temperatures between those sites, we see a significant, a 10 degree increase in temperature um, for those first two sites. And the reason for that um, is these online ponds. There's about five large online ponds, um, all top draw, and they really have significant impacts on uh, the water temperature within this creek. So it goes from one of our coldest, um, best brook trout habitat, for example, to some of our worst in the matter of a couple of kilometers. So we know it's an issue. Um, climate change is, is, um, is a particularly hot topic right now. We know our air temperatures are gonna be warmer. We know that's related to water temperatures. So chances are our water temperatures are also gonna um, increase, which could have profound implications for our, our sensitive streams. And so is there anything we can do about it? Um, fortunately there is. Uh, one of the first steps uh, we could take is just to know where all our sensitive habitats are. Um, so where are our cold water streams? Um, you know, where are our cold water sections in our, in our deeper lakes? Um, just knowing that alone, um, we have a pretty good idea that there's sensitive fish living there and that they're gonna be likely under, under stress from a, a warming climate, for example. But in terms of actual tangible actions, um, one, of the ones, one of the things we can do is try to maintain these spring fed conditions. And, um, two key ways we can do this. One is to reduce these hardened surfaces. So when we, for example, pave over a large area, water is not allowed to infiltrate um, into the ground and cool off underwater, uh, basically just runs off. And if you can picture a, a nice black hot pavement, um, rainwater hitting that, it's extremely warm by the time it reaches our creek. And we can also protect these groundwater recharge areas through planting and policy, for example. I mentioned the Oak Ridges Moraine, but there's a large number of areas, for example, eskers and other kind of sand and gravel areas on our landscape that are really important as, as recharge areas. 
increase stream shading. Um, so anything we can do to shade our waters um, will be beneficial. So this means planting or maintaining trees and shrubs along the water's edge, lots of overhanging vegetation, for example, just to prevent um, warming from the sun. And I mentioned online ponds. So we can mitigate these. Uh, we do know how to help them out a little bit. We don't have to necessarily remove them. Um, there are certain strategies, for example, a bypass channel. Um, we, re we recreate a channel where the cold water stream doesn't enter um, the creek anymore. It bypasses it, or sorry, it doesn't enter the pond anymore. It bypasses it and therefore um, eliminates that warming that comes along with, with online ponds. And we can also retrofit, um, and, you know, in some cases, these online ponds are great habitat for other things. Um, for example, provincially significant wetlands. And we really don't want to muck with it too much. A lot of these have been there for 50 or 100 years on our landscape. Um, but there are opportunities to convert um, a surface draw to a bottom draw. And like I mentioned, this cold water tends to sit below the warm water. And um, we, can, we can now uh, send that water downstream instead of the, the surface waters. So that's a quick crash, crash course on um, water temperature and fish in our jurisdiction. Uh, thank you for attending and your attention. Uh, if you're interested in the topic um, and looking for more information, just a quick Google search on Kortha Conservation Watershed Monitoring. Uh, we've got lots of reports um, and other information on water quality and water quantity, for example, of our lakes and streams. Uh, if you Google thermal preferences of fish or cold water streams and climate change, you'll also get uh, lots of information as well. Um, there's my email at the bottom there and my telephone number. So please don't be shy and, and reach out if you have any questions. So thank you. And Emma, I'll turn it over back to you. Thank you very much, Brett. And thanks for the fantastic presentation. I think I, I learned quite a bit myself there. So um, I'm just going to say, say if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. And if you would prefer not um, to be on camera, you can use the chat function at the bottom um, and do it that way. So I guess I was really interested, Brett, in um, the chemistry of cold water streams. So, you know, do, do the fish that you were talking about prefer it slightly acidic or more alkaline? As, does that have some factor on that kind of sensitive, uh, sensitive water that they, they prefer? Mm -hmm. um, certainly, yes. Uh, so our, our groundwater streams, um, groundwater fed streams, our cold water streams, because uh, they are spring fed, um, they typically are kind of more, um, more alkaline. Um, in our area, we have a lot of, uh, you know, limestone bedrock and, and kind of mineral soils and that type of thing. Um, and so they typically are kind of less acidic than our, our surface water uh, systems as well. Um, but generally nowadays, um, you know, if this was 20 years ago, we were talking about acid rain. Um, that was a, you know, a significant stressor on um, all fish, for example. And there's certain dead lakes um, where the water looked um, perfectly clear and beautiful, but there was just kind of devoid of life. And there still are some lakes out there, um, but in our area, because of the kind of well buffered bedrock, um, the alkaline bedrock, it's not it's not that much of an issue um, generally in our in our jurisdiction in terms of you know pH affecting fish. Okay, thank you. And you you mentioned the the Oak Ridges moraine, so um, I guess I'm more widely across Ontario, what's the kind of distribution like of cold water streams, thinking much beyond our jurisdiction, but just interested in what, what that bigger picture looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, prior to kind of European settlement, um, cold water streams and, and sensitive fish were pretty much ubiquitous. If you can imagine, um, you know, most of this area was forested. And if you've ever, you know, if you walked into a forest right away, you know, it's cold, it's cooler, right? It's shady, that type of thing. Um, and so these sensitive fish were 
just more widespread than they are now. And in our area, for example, there's been research done in um, zone 17. So, uh, you know, if you're an angler, you kind of know zone 17 is our recreational fishery zone here. And studies suggest that, you know, these cold water um, habitats and, and brook trout distribution is significantly reduced from where it once was. Um, so only about 8% of kind of these native brook trout of native brook trout populations remain intact um, with the rest kind of being you know extirpated so lost um, and you know very tough to get back or the other ones just being degraded um, you know it's too warm for example or it's too silty or um, you know dissolved oxygen is not as great as it should be thank you I feel like I'm learning even more now <laughs> That's good, that's why we're here. So I guess, um, I guess I know the answer to this, but in terms of projects that Koala Conservation are currently doing in terms of mitigating for you know, the online ponds, is there anything you could just share, share with people on that? Yeah, we, um, you know, the, the online pond kind of issue um, is not just on, for example, Fleetwood Creek. That was just an example that I showed that kind of clearly illustrates the impacts. Um, if you drive along the landscape in our area, you will see there are hundreds of these kind of online ponds, you know, for various reasons, um, whether it was to, you know, water, have a watering source for cattle or um, just kind of have like a recreational kind of wildlife habitat um, or that type of thing. So they are everywhere. And um, kind of as an industry, um, they're very complex, right? Some have not uh, kind of more historical significance. Some have recreational significance. For example, they're, you know, places to skate, you know, in the winter and that type of thing. So just, you know, removing them and mitigating them is kind of a, a challenge and not an easy fix. And so at Kortha Conservation, we're focusing on, um, and learning on how best to not only approach um, landowners with um, information, you know, this is just the potential impacts that you're having. And if you're interested in, in mitigating, um, you know, we do have um, assistance programs, for example, shoreline naturalization and streamside shading programs where we can um, help people with technical advice on what to plant and provide money, for example, on um, stock, uh, you know, trees and shrubs. Um, so that's one important thing. And, um, and also we are working with partners just to get a better idea of what a bottom draw kind of structure would look like. Um, what are the kind of permits required for that? Uh, in what instances would they work well? And in what instances may they not? Um, and we're also, busy in just identifying where um, these cold water streams and cold water habitats exist. In our area, um, there hasn't really been that much on the ground sampling um, to identify the presence of these sensitive you know, features. And so part of our uh, monitoring programs at Kortha Conservation is focused on just identifying you know, where brook trout exist, for example, on the landscape. So we are active, um, trying our best to, to help with the issue. Thanks, Brett. And we have um, just a comment through the chat. And so the comment is from Lyle, and it says, it would seem keeping water levels higher for longer would be beneficial for the fish in general. Why isn't that a guiding principle in the lakes that have their levels managed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, that's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. I'd be more than happy to talk with you, Lyle, um, you know, on that kind of offline um, if you need, but, um, you know, generally it can go either way um, in terms of water temperature and fish. Uh, higher water levels doesn't necessarily mean um, colder or water 
temperatures um, and you know better or worse habitat, for example. And I'm thinking both in our lakes um, and our streams as well. But I'll be more than happy to uh, to dig into that a little bit more detail uh, offline. Thanks, Brett. And then we've just got another comment um, through the chat. So do stormwater retention ponds act in a similar way to online ponds to warm up streams? Are they also an issue in our jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is yes. Um, if they are online, if they are connected, um, then they can have an impact, um, particularly during precipitation events. So these kind of, you know, storm events um, where they tend to fill up and um, if they kind of exceed the capacity, then they can spill out, particularly in the summer, um, that can be an issue. There really hasn't been any studies, um, comprehensive studies in our jurisdiction to kind of prioritize which ones might be an issue. And just in general, nowadays, from a, a planning and design point of view, um, they are, gen like, a, for example, a newly constructed stormwater management pond. Um, generally, they do not cause that much of an issue um, across our landscape. Kind of these relic ones um, kind of do that are still out there that we're really not sure, um, in some cases, where they are. Um, but new ones, the design standards have changed and, um, you know, the, the profile of cold water streams and aquatic habitat and just the impact of temperature on our streams. Uh, we really advanced the science on that over the last, um, you know, number of years. Uh, so the short answer is, is yes, they do have an impact. That's right. Thank you very much, Brett. So I'm not seeing any more comments on the chat. Um, so I'm guessing the questions have come to an end. Um, so I was just going to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank Brett hugely for doing the presentation. It's been really, really interesting and uh, enjoyable. And then I just wanted to point uh, attention to our next session, which is in October uh, on groundwater. That will be hosted by Irina Shuliarenko. So that's October the 22nd. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And I see Lyle's just uh, said a thank you for the presentation as well. So we appreciate that. So I'll end the session here. Enjoy the rest of your day and weekend. Thanks again for joining us.